uh, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Nova Miskoska, who I've known now for about five years, believe it or not. And she still talks to me, so we must be doing something okay here together. Um, Nova is a research fellow at the Marine Biological Association, and she is also a senior lecturer in marine biology at the University of Liverpool. And she also heads up with uh, Professor Steve Hawkins, the Mark Lim long-term uh, data set project, which obviously Nova is going to explain in more detail in a moment. Um, I note actually from uh, Nova's uh, profile, the MBA, she calls herself a physiological ecologist, which is the same fantastic. So I'm, I'm sure Nova will kind of explain that a bit more also. So, um, yeah, um, should be a really interesting talk tonight on uh, South Devon climate change hotspot. Uh, I'd just like to put it on public record that I hold Nova pub publicly responsible for making me, turning me into a, a barnacle nerd. So, um, <laughs> and I've never looked back. So I, I thank Nova very much for all the help she's given me over the last few years. So without too much ado again, I shall hand you over to Nova to start her talk. Many thanks. Thanks, Mike. I'm just about to share my screen with everybody. I'm a kind of make a piece of just thinking about it. Right, can everybody see my, my first slide there? Yep. Excellent. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for uh, virtually joining me in my dining room. It's very nice to have you all. And I'm going to talk about um, why South Devon is a climate change hotspot and some of the research um, that we do in South Devon. Can I just say for that, it's very nice to see several um, long term colleagues, uh, not all from South Devon, but all with connections to South Devon. Um, and also Catherine, who is doing her PhD with, at the moment, with me at the moment, who used to be in South Devon, but who's moved just a little bit further along the coastline. So thank you all for coming. So we'll just start with a bit of uh, background knowledge for climate change. So the last um, IPCC assessment report, because um, there's a new one imminently due out, the last report um, said that the planet has been warming with increases in temperature of the seas um, of about 0.1 degree per decade um, since the 1970s, which is an amazing decade because that's when I was born. And it might not sound like it's a huge amount of temperature increase, you know, 0.1 degree C per decade. But this is um, actually quite a large amount if you're used to living in an environment where it hasn't usually changed very much over a much longer time period. And this report said that there's very high confidence that surface water warming is being driven by atmospheric emissions of greenhouse gases emitted by those humans. And they also noted um, that deeper waters are also warming because of carbon dioxide. And this report was the first one that actually also noticed that ocean acidification is occurring and the pH of the oceans have been decreasing um, since an industrial revolution began uh, and are continuing to increase as well. So not great, I don't think, for our, for our oceans with climate change. But it's called climate change. Because whilst everybody thinks that the, the entire planet is just warming, uh, it's actually not doing. And I think this is a really, really insightful um, image on the left-hand side, which is from NOAA. And as you can see here, they've got different uh, coloured squares, which show different um, temperatures. And if you look just off to the northwest of the UK, it's actually started cooling in recent years. So whilst we've had a, like a, a longer term increase since 1980s of sea surface temperature, from about 2010, it actually started to cool again a little bit. So I think this is why it's really important um, to use the term climate change as opposed to just global warming. And the reason that we get in these cool spots um, is that the Gulf Stream system's weakening. And um, there's something called the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, which thankfully has a nice um, acronym, which is a lot easier to say. 
Uh, and this is actually um, slowing down. This is not new. It's been talked about since the 1980s. Um, but what I think is really worrying to anybody that cares about the oceans is that this completely can completely break down. And the tipping point had been forecast to happen with a moderate warming um, of two to four degrees C, which we're probably going to see um, across the rest of the century. There's a 20% there's a chance of this completely breaking down. But more concerning, with a four to eight degrees C rise in temperature, um, which is also likely to happen, um, there's a 65% chance um, of the MOC completely breaking down and the whole circulation system stopping. I even want to think about what will happen in, in that case. Um, but again, most people don't even realise that this is actually happening. So we'll just do a, a little bit um, about biogeography to set the scene. Um, the image here, Keith will be familiar with this, Mike will be familiar with this, Julia will be familiar with this, Catherine's familiar with this, uh, uh, Toby probably be familiar with this as well. Um, this is a very old uh, map by Forbes in the, 19, in the 1850s. And this just shows basically the biogeographic provinces um, that the UK uh, sits on. And we're right in the middle of a transition zone between cooler waters to the north and warmer waters to the south. So a lot of species reach the distribution li limits on the rocky shores of England, which is what makes it a really good area to start studying these things on. And not only do we have this biogeographic range, we also have a range of different exposures on coastlines as well. And this is what we would call extremely exposed. Um, and I was saying to Mike, this is my one cheat slide because this is actually from Cornwall, not Devon, because this is Stenning Cove. This is one of our Markham sites, but thankfully it's never been quite this rough on a day that we've tried to survey it. But Stenning Cove will be classed as extremely exposed. This is Brixham um, in South Devon. And this is a moderately exposed shore. And then this is also in Devon, and this is a very sheltered shore. And you can see that just by how much um, the shore's covered by um, nice macroalgae. So we have a range of different um, exposures um, of different shores in South Devon as well. So our special guest for this evening, Mike Burrows, can answer any questions about this after my talk, because um, I'm not doing it, he can do it. <laughs> Um, but Mike has um, a free, if you want to go to his webpage, um, wave exposure model that he's worked out, which means that when we're doing studies of rocky shores, we can actually work out exactly what the wave exposure is for wh wherever of interest um, that we're looking at in the UK. Uh, and the way this works, it estimates wave energy and then its effects on ecosystem functioning um, by using um, a 2D array in the model grid. Um, and as you can see from the image on the right there, you can see all the different um, wave exposure um, areas that you can look at for the UK. So if any of you are interested in finding more about this, head to Mike's website um, and you can, you can see it all there. And I think one thing that's, that's important to note is that organisms are not actually affected by global climate change, they're actually affected by weather and what they're actually experiencing in the tiny little environment that they're actually sitting on in the rocky shore. Um, and I like this picture on the left here. This is from um, a friend of uh, mine and Mike's, um, Brian Helmuth, who, who get, let me use this one. He always says that um, climate change is the weather, but weather throws the punches. And if you look at the middle graph here, this is Cellar Beach, um, and this is in, in South Devon as well. And this is um, sea surface temperature from the 1980s to, um, to the, the, the mid 2000s. And you can see that there's a huge variation in sea surface temperature um, locally, not this just this gradual increase um, in marine climate. And on the right hand side here, this shows sea surface temperature um, just recorded over one year. Um, at Cellar Beach as well. And the line, which is mysteriously moved, um, should be showing what the mean annual sea surface temperature is um, for Cellar Beach, which is about 14 and a half degrees. But if you look at the logger points, that temperature is actually only experienced on two days in the year. So it's not really helpful when we're trying to work out why organisms are responding, if we use just means, because this is not what the organisms are experiencing. They're experiencing a huge range of different temperatures. 
So the project um, that I first started on 19 years ago now, when I was a mere whippersnapper, um, was the Marine Biodiversity and Climate Change Project, Marklin. Um, and Mike has worked on this since the beginning as well. So um, I think that's, that's something to be proud of, that Mike's still talking to me after Mike Boris after uh, 19 years. But basically, Marklin um, is a UK-wide project, and it was set up to synthesise and interpret historical data dating back to the 1950s um, from Professor Alan Southwards and Dennis Chris, um, the 1980s by Professor Jack Lewis and his team at Robin Hood's Bay Laboratory, um, and then Steve Hawkins, who continued this uh, from the 1980s. And we're looking at bringing all this historical data together with the current data that we collect for intertidal rocky shore species. So the first thing we did is we repeated the classic broad scale surveys um, in the early 2000s and then picked a suite of sites around the UK coastline that we thought would be very good to look at different changes. We set up this, this long term network of sites in order to monitor change on an annual basis. And then Mike's, uh, Boris's job on the project, because he's good at maths and I'm not, Mike's job is, is, is looking at forecasting future change in species distributions using the UK Climate Impacts Partnership, not UKIP, please don't mistake that. <laughs> We're definitely not UKIP supporters. Uh, the UK Climate Impacts Programme's climate scenarios. And a really big part of the NBA's um, kind of like incentive for science and a really big part of my research as well is to help inform policymakers um, to make informed decisions on the marine environment and address the implications to society. So I spend a lot of time taking the data that we collect and the findings and pushing them out to policymakers to make sure that they can make decisions based on science, which I think is really important. So here is the Markland team and the Markland sites. Um, there's a lovely picture of Mike Burroughs in his yellows up in the, in the top right. We've got Steve Hawkins in um, the bottom um, right-hand corner there. This is his favourite picture because it's the first time he found a quadrat with nothing but the uh, warm water limpet patel depressor in it. Um, and then the bottom left is Louise Firth. She teaches at Liverpool, uh, sorry, Plymouth University. And then the top left is myself and Heather Sugden, who is teaching at Newcastle University. And this team have been doing a lot of surveys around the UK for the past, what, 19, 20 years. Uh, and as you can see from the map there, we've got really, really good coverage. The Northern Ireland, we've only been able to do a couple of times. Julia was um, present with us that time that we were searching for what was then Monodonta, which has changed names multiple times since then. But we all still know it as Monodonta. <laughs> um, and between this small group of people, it's meant that we've been able to do a lot of different surveys, but, but without a huge amount of operator bias in it, because we've all been trained and cross-calibrated regularly with each other. And what we've managed to achieve, uh, and this also dates back to uh, the 1950s with Alan and Dennis as well, is Markham is now, um, it's the biggest intertidal time series in the world. And with all of this fantastic data that we've got dating back to the 50s, um, we've been able to detect some of the fastest shifts in species ranges in response to climate change in any natural system, which I think is phenomenal. And that's probably mainly due to the fact that if you think about everything that lives on the rocky shore, it's either stuck to the shore or it can't move very far at all. Um, and yes, we have some um, species that do disperse further, but it actually turns out that the species like the barnacles that have got distribution, that they've got distributions, um, larval distributions that they're further, actually don't extend the ranges as quickly because maybe one or two individuals might settle on one shore. And if they're not close enough for direct reproduction, then the population doesn't start off or it takes a long time to become established. Whereas my favourites, the top shells, because they're only in the water column um, in the planktonic phase for a couple of days and then they settle, thousands of them travel a short distance. And as soon as the next location becomes climatically suitable, lots of them can survive and they can rapidly build up a population. So hopefully this explains why they're doing, they're showing some of the fastest responses, um, just because they're, they're literally at the cold face of climate change, unfortunately, all of these things. So we'll just quickly go back to biogeography. Um, Southwest England is actually what I would call a climate change hotspot because we're right on this um, 
this join between the colder and the warm waters, many, many species reach the limits in or around um, the southwest region. And I'm just going to go through some little things that we've been doing um, around South Devon. So again, harking back to Mike Burroughs, and I'd like to say, Mike, this is completely coincidental that I've dropped a lot of slides about you and my talk. Mike did his PhD um, on barnacles and set up experiments um, in uh, just into Cornwall um, at Rainhead uh, and then in South Devon um, back in the 1980s to look at barnacle settlements. And I went and um, set the same experiments out again um, in, I think it was 2015, and have been surveying them ever since at three different shores to look at whether climate change is having an impact on which species settle. And then also, does it depend on what's actually already there? So if there's uh, if the cold water species, semi-balanced balanoides, does that do better in colder years? But does it also settle preferentially if there are more semi balanced already there? So we do these experiments, um, and then also, on top of that, we're also using the fantastic time series um, that was the legacy of Alan Southwards um, at Cellar Beach in Devon, which dates back to the early 1950s. And the graph on the left here shows the sea surface temperature anomaly. So colder years were represented by blue bars and warmer years by red bars. And as you can see, that the, the temperature anomaly has been increasing in recent years which unfortunately for the colder water barnacles, semi-balanced balanoides is not great. And in some shores in South Devon, it's actually quite difficult to find semi-balanced these days. Whereas the warm water species, Capamelus and Montaguay and Stellatus are absolutely loving the fact that it's getting warmer. And as you can see from the red line, they're doing incredibly well. And I think this is a question um, that I first got asked a very long time ago. So if there's still as many barnacles on the shore, well, who cares? And I think, well, all of you lot care and I care because it's about looking at biodiversity and it's about looking at species extinctions. And for people like us, it is really, really important. It's, they're not just barnacles, they're different species. They come from different parts um, of Europe. Um, and to me, it's really important that we know, you know, if one species is disappearing, this is something that we need to work out how quickly and how much of it is due to climate change as well. But we don't just look at tiny things like barnacles. We're also looking at the bigger things um, like kelp forests. And one of the things we've been using the marking data to answer is, well, is kelp forest community composition or bed size important? And um, around the shores of South Devon, what we've seen is that there's been um, a slight increase in the abundance of warm water, Lusitanian species of kelp. Um, and there's been one species, Laminaria ocreluca, um, that's, appeared, that's appeared in a couple of sites in, in South Devon. But over the last few decades, this hasn't increased in abundance or, or populated a lot more areas. The other warm water species, Saccharisa polychides, um, this, however, has really, really taken off. And below four metres, which, which I don't survey, but we've been very fortunate to have um, students um, from Plymouth University who've been able to go and do diving for the projects. And they found that below four metres in Plymouth Sound, a lot of areas now are monospecific stands of this warmer water kelp. And the colder water laminarian species um, have virtually disappeared from some areas. So we still have the same size of kelp bed and it still occupies the same vertical range, but it's just different species that are present. And again, this is a question that people think, well, does that matter? If you look at the bottom left photograph, this is a holdfast of Saccharisa polychides, and this holdfast is very, very different from the laminarian kelps, and it supports a completely different set of species that live on it as well. So there may be the same amount of seaweed down there in the kelp beds, but it's supporting a completely different set of species um, associated with it. So again, this is something that I do think is really important. We also look at invasive species, and again, the southwest is a hot spot for marine invasions. Um, those of you that, that did do co coast, um, like Mike Paulston did, um, will have taken part in the marine invaders surveys um, that we ran, and these are still occurring all around Britain. We also have done experiments at the NBA mesocosm system, so the little grids in the second picture there show invasive um, species of anemone. 
um, Didymene that we looked at because again that's starting to become prolific in the marinas um, in and around the southwest. The third set of images there that's Salcombe and I've been waded around there in Salcombe estuary with um, my friend Stacey Kruger Hadfield who's the bottom right picture there um, she works at University of Alabama in America, um, but she works a lot on the um, molecular side of seaweeds. And we went paddling in Salcombe the last time she came to visit. And then we found an invasive species of red algae there, Gracilaria vermiculophylla. So there's an awful lot of invasive species that are appearing um, in South Devon as well. And as the species, the species seems to do a lot better as the climate is getting warmer as well. And we've worked with the University of Roscoff um, doing genetic studies on this. And it shows that for a lot of species, they've got a much wider temperature range than native, native species. So they can do a lot, lot better in a huge range of conditions. And uh, we'll look at certain shores um, across the uh, South Devon area. So this is Wembury Marine Reserve, um, very close um, to the, the MBA in Plymouth. And the picture there is um, of the hairy-handed hermit crab, Clybenarius erythropus. And I'm just going to get off my chest, little bugbear. It's been given the common name of St. Piran's crab. It's not Cornish! It was, if it, you know, it appeared in Devon and Cornwall in the 1950s. And then a combination of the climate cooling again and probably TBT um, and intersex in dog whelks, which it likes to use um, as a home, meant that it disappeared back onto um, the French coastline um, for almost half a century. And it's only in recent years that we've started to find Clybenarius again. Um, and it's appeared back at, um, at Wembury, which is nice and convenient. To, to the MBA because it's only a 20 minute drive and then we can we can go and see as much as it if you like. But if any of you lot, when you're out on your adventures in South Devon, see the hairy handed hermit crab, which is also a much better common name because it actually tells you what it is, then please let me know because we're very interested to see if now it's warmer and it's arrived back in, in Britain again, whether it's actually spreading. And then we'll have a look now slightly further along the coastline. Um, and this is Point in South Devon. And it's one of the last places on the English coastline that you get the brown algae uh, Bifocaria bifurcata, which is in the top left hand picture. And it used to always have its range limit um, just, just around the corner here between here and Dartmouth. And, uh, and then suddenly um, it appeared on Portland Bill. Uh, in the early 2000s when I started surveying there, but nowhere in between. And this is really confusing because you think that's a huge, a huge shift in distribution. And as you can see from the map, we've got lots of sites between Prawl Point um, and Portland Bill, and we've never ever found it, any of them. But what we have found is that at Cherbourg um, in Northern France, that we survey every year as well, um, there's also bifurcaria, and it's actually a shorter distance um, across the channel. And the way that the circulation works in the English Channel, it's more than likely that bifurcaria has actually come across from Cherbourg to, um, to Portlandville than it has um, from South Devon. So I've taken lots of samples, uh, and again, I'm going to send them off to Stacey in America, and because she does an awful lot of molecular work. And hopefully she'll be able to trace the origin of the Portland Bill population and work out whether the South Devon um, the population is responsible for seeding this or whether it's actually come from the continent. I also do quite a lot of um, biotope mapping. For those of you that, that don't know what um, biotope mapping is, um, this is the best handbook. It's free and available online um, from Natural Resources Wales. And basically what, what you do is you walk along um, a shoreline and you have a map of the shoreline. I use um, aerial, aerial photography images and they map what's called biotopes. Now biotopes um, are essentially a human artifact. They're just clumps of, of a few species that are characterized by the most abundant two or three species in the biotope. But what you do is you walk around the shore, you draw blobs on maps and you give them different numbers and then you can actually characterize each biotope based on the, the main component species. You then take these, these messy maps that you do in the field um, and then you, you produce um, GIS, um, orthorectified images on a digital map and enter all the data into a database um, and then we classify the code. 
Now, one thing that I've been able to do with the government agencies that commission this work is also to introduce quantitative surveys. So every biotope blob that I draw on a map, I put multiple quadrats down and do replicated quadrat surveys in each biotope so that we've actually got quantitative information that whoever comes back and does the next biotope assessment in usually six years time, um, wh whatever they think the biotope is and however many biotopes they think they are, they can directly compare the quantitative quadrat data and at least there's some kind of proper comparison between them. So we've done a lot of biotope mapping as part of the marine conservation process in South Devon. And thankfully, we were able to put quadrat surveys into the biotope um, mapping process as well. Um, and there's, there's images, there's Heather, she's sitting on the boat there, um, recording some of the shores that we couldn't access by land. Uh, and this is actually um, a, a fantastic boat operator that operates um, called um, Ali, and she operates out of Salkham. And she had, a, she, she had a thing called Code Green because we'd line the side of a rib and we'd have binoculars and we'd be looking at the shoreline and then we'd be shouting out species names. And if either of us felt sick, we just had to shout Code Green and I'd be just take us off for a bit of a drive around in the boat till we felt a bit better. And then she'd bring us back again and we'd carry on surveying. So we did surveys from boats, we did surveys on the shores. Um, and then, as you can see, there's one of my messy maps where we've drawn the different biotopes on there and numbered them. And then all the data gets input into these wonderful GIS maps and they look a lot neater. And on the right hand side, there's a key and the color key um, refers to the specific biotopes there. And this way then the government agencies can compare all of the different biotopes and look at areas that are, that are biodiverse and look at areas that are species poor. And this again helps them with their um, conservation designations. And one interesting thing that we found, and this was just around the corner from Start Point in one of the beaches there, and it was after there'd been some severe storms a few years ago. And if you can see the top right picture there, there was actually a petrified forest that was uncovered. Mm -hmm. And um, it was amazing because we didn't expect to see that there. And there is no biotope. Um, for a petrified forest, <laughs> unfortunately, but we still let Natural England know about it because we thought it was a really important thing that, they, that you know, they didn't know there was a petrified forest there. And if they got covered back over again when the shingle came back, they wouldn't even know it existed. Um, so that I think was the most exciting um, find of all, even though it didn't actually help with the marine conservation zone designation process. And then we'll come along to Brixham. Um, now, Brixham's another nice shore in South Devon that we survey every year, and it's also home to invasive species. It's the um, Slip Olympic Crepidula fornicata. Now, Crepidula, actually, we don't find it on, on the actual rocky shore. It sits just slightly subtidally. There are always people that go diving for scallops, and when they come out, they, they go on the, on the rocky shore, and they obviously um, open the scallops up, take the meat out of the scallops, and just throw the shells there. So every time we come and do a survey at Brixham, there are always a load of scallop shells thrown by, and they've all got crepidula on them. So this is a fantastic resource for us, because while you don't see them on the rocky shore, you know that they're literally just a metre or two underneath the tide line, because all of these people have been in like hand diving them and have found crepidula there. So again, this is where people that aren't scientists accidentally help us out by leaving clues as to what, what invasive species are lurking just underneath the surface. Then another of our um, nice sites here, this is at, um, in, at Corbin Head at Torquay. Uh, Mike uh, Paulston knows this very well because he found the invasive species uh, water cipra <laughs> subatra there. This is one of the last places that we found along, along the, the south coastline where you actually get the high shore fucoid pelvicia. Um, pelvicia um, you can see the picture here. So if any of you are out in doing, doing surveys in, at different shores in South Devon and you find pelvicia canonculata, please can you let me know again? Because this would be really, really interesting to know oh. where it is and where it isn't these days. Because as part of Markham, we've tracked changes in, in range edges and I think pelvicia it's, it's something that most people just walk past it's at the top of the shore you walk past it while you're actually looking for other stuff but it's really really important to us to know where exactly this species finishes its distribution and it's looking like it may well be in South Devon so again your group can be instrumental in helping us out with records for this one 
We don't just look at climate change, we also look at ocean acidification, which again is another result of us pumping as much carbon dioxide as we can into the atmosphere. And at the NVA, I'm very fortunate to have a very big mesocosm tank system. There's a picture of it down in the bottom left there. And we can control air temperature, sea temperature, um, the pH of the water from ocean acidification. We can also change the salinity. We can add nutrients to it. Um, and we can add to all sorts of different things. So we can run long-term experiments to see what the effects of temperature from climate change and acidification um, are on different species. And some of the, the biggest things that we found is we've looked at dog whelks and we have been there for long enough that they actually laid eggs in the system. And the dog whelks show, the biggest change we saw in the dog whelks was actually for the first um, few months where everything either just did nothing at all. The shell length, the shell width, the weight of it, nothing changed at all. And then suddenly, when it, when, after they'd been in the system for a few months, they all started growing. And they all started growing at different rates, depending on whether they were in warmer water, more acidified water. Mm -hmm. This was a huge lesson to us. And it's something that Catherine also found when she was doing um, oyster experiments in, in the mesocosm as well is that a lot of marine species need at least a few months to get used to being in, in captivity in tanks. And if you think about most experiments that are done on ocean acidification, they're only run for five or six weeks. They're very, very short term. So they're not actually recording the animal's responses to ocean acidification. They're recording the animal's responses to, oh my goodness, I've been put in this tank and I don't know where I am and I don't like it. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to shut up. So for me, this was a really, really important lesson, which was you need to run long-term experiments and you need to disregard the first few months before you start to look at the res results because then you're actually getting the results from the exposure to the treatments rather than just the animals hating being in the, in the tank systems. And we've been very fortunate to have a lot of help from lots of different experts um, all around the globe, actually. Um, we've got people at University of Bristol. So Danny Schmidt um, has been using her fantastic um, microscope system. Um, it's amazing. They use it a lot to look at dinosaur bones, um, but she applied it to the common periwinkle there, Littorina litteria. And ocean acidification actually changes um, the shape of the aperture of the shell. So where species are used to being able to, to seal to the rocks and provide a really, really good seal, Ocean acidification is meaning that this seal isn't as good as it used to be. So this is a completely different uh, result that we weren't expecting at all. And had we not got Danny's team at Bristol, we would never know they existed. We also are looking at transcriptomics. So basically which genes are switched on and switched off um, in response to climate change and ocean acidification. Here I'm incredibly lucky to have Peter Holland from the University of Oxford uh, and Joanne Hui from the Chinese University of Hong Kong who do all the molecular work for this. And again, they found that temperature from climate change and ocean acidification, these, these affect completely different genes um, in, in the dog whelks. So having two stresses actually makes it doubly bad for these organisms because lots more different genes have to be turned on and turned off in order for them to cope with things. And if life wasn't bad enough for them, um, my friend Baden Russell, um, who used to be at the University of Adelaide, but now who's at the, a different university in Hong Kong, the University of Hong Kong, did some work with me, and that's the, the right-hand pictures, on food supply. So not only are these poor animals having to deal with changes in the temperature of the water and the, the, the um, pH of the water from acidification, but also their food source is changing as well. So there's a huge amount of things going on for all of these species. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of this is happening right where you all are in the Southwest. And if life wasn't bad enough, all of these things have got to cope with microplastics as well now. And if you think about how many different species that live on the rocky shores of filter feeders, um, and you imagine that tiny microplastics just being taken into all of these systems, I think this is, again, is yet another stressor um, that they've all got to deal with now. And the concentrations of both macroplastics as they start off and the microplastics that they break down to are increasing um, within coastal waters. And we're finding a lot of evidence now because we, we can run microplastic experiments in the mesocosm system that they're accumulating in filter feeding um, species. And as I showed you from the earlier slide, 
we're getting a lot of synergy between stresses. So they're all having different effects on animals. So they're having to deal with so many different things from temperature and, and acidification of the water and then microplastics as well. Um, that these are likely to have really big consequences for diversity and also ecosystem structure in the rocky intertidal as well. And microplastics bioaccumulate in, in the guts of a lot of animals like blue mussels. Um, you can see images here. And this is another friend of mine, Mark Brown, who now works in Australia, who's done a lot of work as well on microplastics. And he's shown that um, if you use fluorescent microplastics, like we do in our experiments, you can actually see where they end up inside the organisms. And they go into the gut and then they transfer all around the circulatory system and then they end up becoming stored in tissues and cells. And it takes many, many months before animals can get rid of all of these microplastics, which is really, really bad, I think, for these organisms. And also it might cause one or two of you to maybe think about this as well, because if you're out eating local shellfish, you might be eating microplastics as well. So is there ever a better incentive? To, to use as little single use of plastic as possible. It's the fact that you may well have eaten it in the long run. Not me, I'm a vegetarian, so <laughs> I'm quite safe in that respect. And this is the experiment that we did. And again, this is where South Devon is a fantastic hotspot for this. Um, I don't know if you know, but South Devon is a hybrid zone between different species of blue mussels. Um, so we've got Mytilus edulis, Michael's gal provincialis, and then we've got the hybrids where, where they, um, they hybridise with each other. And in southwest England is a hot spot for these, um, these hybrids. Um, you can see that it, the study's been done across Europe, and this is one of the, one of the hot spots for hybridisation of these two species um, right across the European coastline. So we brought the hybrid into the lab and we ran um, a year long experiment and we looked at climate change with water temperatures. So we ran different water temperatures of 15 and 19 degrees centigrade. We then used different carbon dioxide concentrations to simulate acidification. And then we exposed some of these mussels to microplastics and other mussels we, we didn't expose to microplastics. Every single mussel, as Catherine knows, um, because she helped out on this and her own PhD experiment, every single mussel in there, and there are hundreds and hundreds of them, were all individually numbered with B tags. So we can take them out, we can measure them, we can weigh them um, every week, and we can work out which ones die as well. So we can keep really good track of the responses to microplastics. Oh, sorry. Uh, and what we found from this, I think it, with, the, with the game, which was quite shocking, is that as you add different stresses, so the muscles, um, they did okay if you got slightly warmer, um, but they didn't perform as well. When you add ocean acidification into the mix, they also struggled even more um, because they calcify, they grow calcium carbonate shells. And this is actually harder when the water's more acidic because of the chemical equations. So it's harder to grow shells when it's, when it's more acidic. So not only are you being assaulted by warmer waters, you're also finding it more difficult um, to grow shells. And then they're also ingesting microplastics as well, which they're really struggling with. And blue mussels, um, when they ingest um, heavy metals, They've got a really, really cunning strategy, which they, they get rid of the muscles from the soft body tissue by sticking it into the shells, which is fantastic because it's the best place. If they can't get rid of the metals, the best place to stick it is in the shell because that's where it does it the least amount of harm. Unfortunately for the blue mussels, they can't do this with microplastics. So they can't stick it into the shell as almost like a safety defense mechanism. They have to keep trying to circulate around the system until they can finally get rid of it. And um, we actually saw something that was really unusual um, with the mussels is microplastics, they're five microns in diameter. You probably get a million particles in a tiny little epidorph, they weigh nothing. But the mussels actually changed the weight noticeably when they were exposed to plastics. So we're not sure yet exactly what's happening, but there's been a real change in, in the muscle physiology and they're putting on more weight when they're exposed to plastics, which is something that we're going to look at in future experiments as well, because we really were not expecting to see that. And on top of that, we're now part of um, a huge new project called the Darwin Tree of Life. And the MBA is what's called a genome acquisition lab. And we're the one marine partner uh, in this huge project. We're also um, involved with the sort of Natural History Museum. There's Kew and Edinburgh Royal Botanic Gardens, Oxford and Edinburgh University, Cambridge University, the Earlham Institute. 
Uh, and what we're doing here is we're trying to get the genome of every single rocky shore species that we can find sampled. Now, just to give you a very, very quick um, insider's guide to what this is and what's going on. So what a genome is, it's an organism's complete set of what we call genetic instructions. So it's, to put it basically, it's the sum total of an organism's DNA. And each genome contains all of the information that's needed to build that individual organism and to allow it to grow and to allow it to develop. So the genome is, is basically the underpinning um, of everything that, that makes up whatever organism that you're looking at. Um, and the aim of the Darn Tree of Life eventually is to sequence the genomes of all 60,000 species um, of eukaryotic organisms in Britain and Ireland. And all of these data and genomes are going to be freely available um, online as they come online. But the best thing for me um, is that all of the Markland species um, are having the genome, the genome sequence as part of the, the initial phase, which is fantastic, um, which means that we'll get so much more information um, that, that we never ever knew about before. So when we see all of these different rocky shore species changing in abundance locally and shifting the distributions, we'll now be able to take the genome and we can get um, our friends, molecular colleagues um, to sit with us and actually tell us what genes are responsible for the changes that we're seeing when we're out surveying rocky shore. Now with this kind of information, I'm hoping that we can massively advance our understanding of why some species um, are responding hugely to climate change and why some species don't seem to be having, you know, does not seem to be having any effect on at all. And then we can make even better informed um, decision making um, processes because of this. So we can get all of this information, we can bring together people that do molecular genomics and genetics um, with us that do physiology. We can, we can go out with all of you lot and we can collect data from Rocky Shore surveys. Brilliant people like Mike Burroughs, who are fantastic with maths, can then do phenomenal models and they can forecast what's going to happen in the future with a huge amount more accuracy. And this way, hopefully, this means that we should be able to better protect a lot of species that we all love um, and see every day when we go down on the rocky shore. Here's a few pictures um, of our team. As you can see, that we're all um, COVID, safe, as COVID safe as possible. Um, with our masks there um, but we also love going out and getting wet um, and sampling stuff as well so we, we, we're getting all these species and bringing them into the lab um, and then we're sending them off to the Sanger Institute and hopefully very very soon we'll be able to get all this data as you all will be able to freely online um, so that we can really start to, to put an extra step into improving our conservation of rocky intertidal species. Mike Paulston first met me when he joined um, our MBMBA's um, Capturing Our Coast Citizen Science Project back several years ago now. Mike Burroughs also ran the Capturing Our Coast um, Scottish Hub. So Mike again was involved in, in this project. Catherine um, Pack, who's also here, she was involved, she was the project officer for Capturing Our Coast. So again, there's so many interlinks between everybody. And here's some of the data that we collected in the southwest, and this shows the differences in types of algal canopies and turfs, and what, what barnacles we found, and mussels, and the different rock. So again, people like you, who just go out there and collect data because you're just obsessed with rocky shores and what lives on them, can have a huge difference to science, because there are only a few scientists and we can't be everywhere. But all of you lot are out there and you could also contribute data as well. And this is why I think your group, your South Devon group is so important because you're able to just cover so much more ground. You're also enthusiastic. I'm always seeing Mike Paulson's posts about which barnacles he's seeing this week and, and, and different <laughs> things that he's found as well. And it's phenomenal because this, this, we've amassed an army between us of intertidal nerds that are out collecting data, which is fantastic because you know, look at how much data we've collected between us all, so much more um, than, we're, than scientists are able to collect on our own. So I, I'm really pleased that your group is doing well, even though we're in lockdown, because uh, at least you're still allowed to go locally, which for me is the beach, and I guess for you lot is the beach as well, and still collect data, uh, and hopefully keep, could keep doing that when we're actually allowed to uh, actually talk to each other in real life as human beings again. 
So that was just a quick snapshot um, of the research program. So we get um, lots of different data. So from citizen scientists like yourself, from field surveys, field experiments, lab experiments. Um, we then get microclimate data and large scale remote sensing data, bring this all together. We do different types of modeling. So might just fancy mathematical models. Um, Catherine Pack is in the middle of producing what we call bioenergetics models. So this basically looks at um, how an organism behaves and how much energy it has and how it allocates that into growth and reproduction and survival. And these bioenergetics models make it a lot better for us to predict future changes because it's not just about where a species is, but it's about how it's responding to different environmental conditions. And it can give you much more, I think, um, like spatially explicit accurate predictions of where species is like to be in the future and where we're not like to find it in the future. And then, like we say, we give this information to the policymakers um, and explain it to them and hope that they're able to put that into action. And I'll quickly just finish with a few examples of how we do this. Um, DEFRA run the Marine Climate Change Impacts um, Partnership and they do report cards. The last one was published um, about a year ago now, and uh, Mike and I, Mike Burroughs and I wrote the intertidal habitats chapter for this. We've been writing this since it started in the early 2000s. Again, you can go online and this is freely available. And this shows the different regional seas of Britain, the different climate effects that are happening, and then also the different effects, not just to intertidal systems. Mike Burroughs also wrote the subtidal chapter, so um, you can look at what's happening beneath the seas. And then our friends at CFAS have worked on a lot, oh, sorry, a lot of the fish data. Um, and this is brought together in a really, really nice glossy pamphlet. And I think the, the best message I think this gives is that a policymaker probably has 10 minutes walking between meetings um, to, to, to ingest information. They're not going to read the scientific papers that were published, fantastic as they are. They wouldn't understand them probably, even if they tried to read them. So I always say that the best way to get your message through to policymakers is think about how you would communicate this to a five-year-old child. Traffic lights, MSIP report is full of traffic lights, red, bad, amber, <laughs> not great, green, fantastic. Um, and you'll see a lot of this in the report card. And then some really simple bullet pointed key messages so they can basically think, hang on a minute, I actually maybe need to stop and think about the coastline. And maybe I actually need to, to stop falling asleep next time this is discussed, um, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the Houses of Parliament. Because as we've seen, those of, the, those of um, the government and other MPs that do turn up, half the time I've got the feet up and I'm fast asleep anyway. We want people to actually sit up and people say, look, this is important. We need to save our seas. And here's the information that all of the scientists have brought together. So the MSIP Climate Impact Partnership card, it's worth a read and it, there's an awful lot about South Devon in there as well. Yeah. We work on um, MPAs as well. And this is a map that just shows all the different marine protected areas around the UK, the different types of designations of them, and then the little spots for all the Markham sites. So we're really well placed because we've got a lot of sites inside protected areas and a lot of sites outside of protected areas. So we can then do really nice comparisons and we can say, well, there are differences in the northeast of England to southwest Wales. Um, is this due to just it being in a different area or is this because there are different amounts of um, marine protected areas? And then we can compare side by side. So in one area, we've got a marine protected area and a non-protected area. Are we seeing the same kind of changes there or are they different? And this really helps, again, the policymakers um, to, to put their, their activities in, into perspective because there's no point in trying to change something by protecting it if climate change is going to force that species to have to move outside of that area you know irrelevant of anything else so hopefully we're, we're trying to help this process as well by by giving them information on how climate change is going to force things to move and how best to plan for future and, and to make more protected areas that, that are kind of quite sensitive to climate change as well uh, thankfully, we are still part of the EU Marine Strategy Framework Directive, even though we're not European anymore. Um, and Markham data, we've also used this to look at good environmental status. 
And there are various different descriptors, um, including biological diversity has been maintained, non-indigenous such invasive species, and not at levels that are adversely eco affecting the ecosystems, and also that food webs ensure long-term abundance of species. Um, we've done environmental status indicators with Markham species, and Mike Burroughs has also done a fantastic set of uh, species and, and community um, level analyses as well, which also incorporate climate change, which again is showing um, the European Union how things are changing and good environmental status may be changing in UK waters, and how much of this is due to human activities that we can control like fishing and coastal development and eutrophication and how much of this is actually due to things like climate change that even if we never used another bit of electric you know of, of carbon generated electricity again we're still stuck into the climate change um, like rolling for at least the next 20 or 30 years so this work hopefully will help the, at the european level help them better manage um, all of our coastlines we do condition assessments for natural England and natural resources Wales as well. Um, and this basically looks at condition attributes um, within marine protected areas. And condition monitoring, again, is another way of trying to transmit all of this scientific information to people that maybe have a first degree in some kind of biological science, but not necessarily marine. And it helps to, to, for them to interpret it in a way they understand and they can then make informed decisions about it as well. Conservation strategy again, is another thing on, on the, the conservation and policy agenda. And this is what we're also doing is we're helping to increase the marine evidence database um, and help them to inform management, uh, both, as I was saying earlier, inside and outside marine protected areas as well. And to try and deliver better long term outcomes for, for the environment and everything that's living in it, too. Um, I'm going to finish uh, again on another, um, on, on, it's just a negative note, I have to say, there's no way of sugarcoating it. You might have heard of the Convention on Biological Diversity, the 20 IHE biodiversity targets, and they have all these strategic goals to improve diversity, to stop diversity loss, to do all of these, these wonderful things. Um, and 2020 was the, like, the target year where we would stop and we'd assess this and think, oh, how well have we done with achieving our biodiversity targets? Well, we failed. There's not been a single target that's been fully addressed, which again, I think is an absolute shame, not a surprise. Um, but again, this is where groups like yours are really, really useful because we've suddenly got so many more people that are interested, but also you're not only enthusiastic, you're all citizen scientists and you're all experts identifying specific things and looking after them. And you notice change because you go to the same places regularly. So you see when things are doing better, you see when things are disappearing. And you also see when there's been like a, like a localized pollution incident compared to something that you've noticed over years and years and years is either doing better or has disappeared from your local area. So again, this is where you as a group can be really, really instrumental because let's face it, you know, um, the United Nations Decade of Biodiversity has failed to address these targets, which I think is a clear sign that, that us lot as concerned citizens need to be out there and trying to help, help improve the, you know, the knowledge base for everything. So this brings me to my concluding slide and the importance of people like us who care. And it's only by us doing continued research, um, you lot doing a huge amount of volunteer recording um, and a stronger integration between us nerds who get paid to be nerdy and you nerds that do it because you just love the beaches and love going out and uh, doing rocky shore work. And us coming together better and communicating with each other and exchanging data and information. And then all of these now online data platforms, I think one of the few good things about the pandemic is we've all become a lot more savvy about, uh, about, about the internet, talking to each other, finding information online. And there are an awful lot of networks where we can upload our data to now anybody in the world can access it, which is fantastic. And also getting the policymakers um, to understand a lot more what we're all doing. And I think by groups like yours, this is the best way that we can try and hope to reduce climate impacts 
on our marine biodiversity. And so we're not just going paddling and rock pooling. What we're actually all doing is recording information, getting to know each other, networking, and hopefully becoming a stronger community with which we can then pass really, really useful information to the government and they'll hopefully do something about it. And all of these wonderful holidays that I go on, uh, I have to say I've only been on holiday in Britain this year because I've not been allowed to travel outside, but usually I get paid to go around the world um, thanks to all these wonderful um, organisations that fund my holidays, sorry, my data collection of extreme importance. So with that, I would like to say thank you very much um, for listening. Thank you very much for all at least appearing to Tilby Awake on your camera, and I will take any questions.